Uh, Jack, just a little bit south of there, actually, at the Democratic Central Committee in, uh, in Hartford. But that's where the governor is in Windsor Locks, taking in the returns, probably get them, getting them a little bit more quickly than they're coming in here to the committee. They're being posted on the wall opposite me. I'm told that we can expect the governor to come down here somewhere between 8.45 and 9.15. That is not necessarily when she's going to say something. That's when she'll get here. Now to Mary Alice Williams at Saracen headquarters. Bill, we do know that city voters have apparently stayed away from the polls. Voting has been heavy in the suburbs, and that's considered a good sign for Republicans like Ronald Saracen. In his hotel suite upstairs just a few minutes ago, he told us that high school students had given him a two-to-one margin, and he's banking on that, but the polls do show that Governor Grass is in the lead. I'm Mary Alice Williams, now to Chuck Scarborough in New York. All right, Mary Alice, thank you very much. And as we told you at the beginning of the cut-in this time, that we do have a projected winner, Bill Bradley. He will go to the United States Senate. And we'll be back with more on that for you in a moment. On American Airlines, you get what you pay for. As a full fare passenger, only you can select a seat when you make your reservation. You can select seats for your whole trip, including connections and your flight back home. And you can get all your boarding passes at once to avoid all those lines. On American, you finally get the full fare treatment you deserve. You get what you pay for. Carl, uh, tell me, you've been watching the New Jersey race, and uh, how do you feel about a 35-year-old former basketball player who, in his first attempt for elected office, becomes a United States senator? <laughs> well, the choice was between him and a 34-year-old who had, <laughs> had never even played basketball. As the fellow said, he couldn't <laughs> much. <laughs> well, if you can dribble, you can vote, I guess. Right? But, um, but just right quick, let, let me yeah. analyze this, tell you that um, Jim Ryan already gave us a good analysis. The other part of it was Proposition 13 appeal didn't take off in New Jersey because they already have a cap on their spending. We're taking off right now. See you later. <laughs> New Woman tells you about a simple way to wash off 10 years from your face without drugs or surgery and how to lose weight while you keep eating those yummy foods. Pick up New Woman magazine today. Take a break with Bob and Mary. Weekdays, 4 to 5, here on 4. NBC News continues its election night report. Decision 78. Here is David Brinkley. We're back, and I have two projections. One of them, or maybe both of them. Mona may be a surprise. In Tennessee, our projection in the race for governor in Tennessee is that the winner is Lamar Alexander, the Republican. That is a, that is a governor's seat the Republicans have taken away from the Democrats, the first one so far tonight. And another projection in Maryland. Our projected winner in Maryland in the election of a governor is Harry Hughes, the Democrat. Harry Hughes, Democrat, governor in Maryland. Now, if we can take a look at our map, and let me uh, point out to you its more salient features and colors. The blue lights, of course, indicate, in the case of governors, that we have called a Republican winner. The red lights indicate we have called a Democratic winner. Those that are still a sort of pale, yellowish beige mean that so far we haven't called anybody because they don't have the figures yet. And the states in, that remain dark do not have any races of governors or senators this year. Now we're going to take a look at the summary of the election so far. We see that we have called three Democratic governors, we have called three Republican governors, and there is one change. The Republicans, as I've just said, in Tennessee took the governorship by our projection away from the Democrats. Now, the uh, elections of senators, as shown on our map, the same colors, of course. Rep uh, Republican senators, we have called, are shown in blue. Democratic senators, shown in red. In Alabama, as you see, it's, it's only half red, because there's another race there. There are two this year, and we haven't been able to call that one yet. We will in due time. 
The summary of the senatorial elections at this point is as you see it. We've called the, uh, the Democrats as electing five senators, the Republicans electing four senators. Don Harris of our staff in California is talking to a man who in just this very year has become something of a national figure. He uh, may in fact wind up on Mount Rushmore or something equivalent, Howard Jarvis. Don, come in and tell us about it. Howard Jarvis has to be something unique because he isn't running for political office and yet everybody is asking him what he thinks about the election and how things are going. Mr. Jarvis, there are 10 states that have tax reform bills on, on the uh, ballot that could change or immediately cut taxes in the state. Right. Let's take Michigan. That's the one right. we're going to get first results on. How do you predict the outcome in Michigan? I think that the Tisha Amendment will pass. I, my information is that people are going to vote for both of them. They, mo they both may pass. But if they do, the Tisha Amendment will prevail in the important areas of the law, and the people in Michigan will be blessed with a tax cut. But suppose the Tisha Amendment passes, suppose the Headley Amendment passes, right. there is yet a third tax reform measure on the ballot. Yes, I don't think that one's going anywhere. I, don't, I didn't see any particular movement for that. Although it's always possible, but I think the Tisha Amendment, if it passes, will help the people of the state of Michigan and give them a, uh, give them a real property tax reduction, yes. In California, Proposition 13 turned out not to be much of a factor in the governor's race, for example. Brown originally opposed 13, he's ahead in the polls. Younger endorsed 13, he's behind in the polls. Do you really see tax reform and the candidates' positions on tax reform as being a major factor in the elections? Oh, absolutely. The fact that uh, uh, the, 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 what really happened in California, as I'm sorry to say, is that well, Younger blew the whole campaign. Uh, he it's a strange thing for a Republican to say. Well, you are I, a Republican. I know, but the tax issue is not in politics. Uh, he first said that he would vote for it, but he wouldn't campaign for it. And Jerry Brown went all over the state campaigning against it in the strongest possible terms. So now we come down to the end of the election, and Brown turns around and goes 413, and Younger sort of slides slowly along and finally comes out half-heartedly for 13. If Younger had endorsed 13 in the beginning, there'd have been a big fight for the governor of California. Are Brown you yes, or Brown against? and Younger four, and I think Younger would have won. We'll find out how true your projections are, and we'll check with you later in the evening when we get more returns. Right. Don Harris, NBC News in Los Angeles. And we have more projections coming in now that the returns are rolling in. NBC News in the state of Connecticut projects Ella Grasso to be reelected as the Democratic governor of the state of Connecticut. And in the, there you see a small number of votes in, Grasso with 60% of those votes. And in the state of South Carolina, NBC News projects Richard Riley to uh, be the winner in that state's gubernatorial contest, taking the place of Governor James Edwards, a, re a Republican who is ineligible. Riley is a Democrat, and that's important. And there you see the balance of forces on those votes. And also, in the Alabama Senate race, they have two in Alabama this year, NBC News is projecting Donald Stewart, State Senator Donald Stewart, as the winner, the projected winner of the contest against James Martin, former congressman, uh, for the seat that was vacated by uh, Marion Allen, the widow of Senator Allen. And so those are our projections now. Jessica, does that spur any thoughts on your part? It uh, surprises me a little bit, only because there were some last minute revelations that Stewart had electroshock therapy in high school. And that was revealed late in the campaign. And it was thought that maybe that would affect this somewhat, but apparently it hasn't. He's doing as well as had been originally expected a couple of weeks ago. John, I would like to take a look at some of the races in the South where there are, again, no surprises. In Tennessee, Howard Baker running against Jane Eskin, newcomer to politics, one of two women running for the Senate this year. We don't have that much of the voting, but there is enough our computers tell us to say that uh, even though we don't have that many precincts in, that Howard Baker is going to be able to win that race. In Virginia, the race between John Warner, Republican, and Democrat Andrew Miller, 3% of the precincts reporting. This one is close. It's been going back and forth all evening at this point. It shows Miller ahead there. He's got uh, 
52 percent of the vote to Warner's 48 percent. And John Warner, if you will remember, of course, is known as the husband of actress Elizabeth Taylor. And uh, that vote, as we say, has been close, and we'll be watching that race in Virginia. Another southern race in West Virginia, an interesting race here. No precincts in yet, a couple of votes. We're able to say at this point it's running very close. Arch Moore, the governor of the state from 1960, uh, was governor of the state, left in 1976. Jennings Randolph trying to hang mm -hmm. on to his Senate seat. He has been in Congress since Franklin D. Roosevelt. That race is very close. In Mississippi, a race that is very interesting, Mississippi has the largest percentage of black voters anywhere in the country. We have no precincts reporting a little bit of the vote is in and in the others column the others column happens to be independent charles evers the brother of slain civil rights leader medgar evers and if it turns out that way even though there's not that much of a vote in if it turns out that way it could be that evers could have enough of the vote to split the ticket and in that case, instead of Maurice Danton, the Democrat, winning, it could be Republican Thad Cochran. That'd be the first time Mississippi had a Republican senator since Reconstruction. That's the way it looks in the South at this point, John. In the state of um, Arkansas, there's an interesting young man running there, the Attorney General. His name is Bill Clinton, and he's 32 years old. I think Brokaw will support me in that. That's right, he's 32. And when we think about him, he'd be very young if he got elected. We always think about a man who was elected a governor of a state at age 31 back in 1938. And that man, some of you may recall, is Harold Stassen. And guess where Harold Stassen is now? With Carol Simpson. Thank you, John. As you say, we are with Governor Harold Stassen, who last ran for the presidency in 1968 and was governor of Minnesota in 1942. Governor Stassen, the Republicans are awfully optimistic tonight in Minnesota. Why? Yes, we're looking for good news for the Republicans in Minnesota tonight. We have very strong candidates. We've been rebuilding the party all year. And then, of course, we recognize that the loss of Hubert Humphrey was a very serious loss to the Democrats. And even though Walter Mondale and President Carter tried to fill in. They haven't been able to do it. How important has the tax revolt fever sweeping the country been here in Minnesota? It's been important, but more particular, their feeling that the Democrats have been very wasteful and a lot of corruption, and that we do have Republicans who are trustworthy, and I believe they're going to come through to sweeping victories tonight in Minnesota. Thank you very much, Governor Harold Stassen. It will be another 20 minutes before the polls close in Minnesota, and we'll find out if the Republicans' optimism is justified. Carol Simpson, NBC News, in Bloomington, Minnesota. I don't know how many times we've seen Mr. Stassen on these election night programs and seen him running. It's always nice to see him. He has run in 20% of the presidential elections in the entire history of the United States. Well, and he still looks pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do have this to report from the bluegrass area in Kentucky around Frankfurt. The Democrats have lost a congressional seat to the Republicans there. A Republican named Larry Hopkins has won the seat. 96% of the precincts are reporting in, and there's a turnover, Democrat to Republican. And we'll be back with more after this. <laughs> When the first Bell helicopter got off the ground in 1943, it was slower than a family car. Even so, some people thought there'd be a helicopter in every driveway someday. It never happened. But a lot of other things did, enough to create 12,000 jobs at the Bell Helicopter Division of Textron. And that's just a part of the helicopter industry. Instead of a family car, the helicopter became a workhorse, an ambulance that always has a green light, a crane that'll lift three tons, a fire engine that doesn't need ladders or roads. Who could have foreseen all this in 1943? The helicopter found its place because Bell and its competitors were free to respond to needs as they developed and free to keep working on ideas for tomorrow. Competing to find better ways to meet the needs of a changing world that's what private enterprise is all about. And that's what we do at every division of Textron. Every day I got 54 kids to deliver. So when nagging minor arthritis pain and its stiffness get a grip on me, I grab Ben Gay. Ben Gay's fast temporary relief works deep down to break up the pain in my muscles and joints. That's why Ben Gay is America's number one selling arthritis rub. I know it really works for me. When the pain of arthritis has you in its grip, break the
a grip of pain with Ben Gay. We're back and we have two projected winners, both in Arkansas, both Democrats. David Pryor, we project, is the winner in, in the election for a senator in Arkansas. David Pryor, now the governor, running for the Senate, we project him to be the winner. In the election of a governor in Arkansas, we project Bill Clinton, the Democrat, the winner. And he is, I believe, 31 years old, is that what 32. you said? 32 years old, youngest governor in the country, one of the youngest in our history. Those are the figures as we have them at the moment. As you see, they are not voluminous of the figures we have brought in. We have other sources of information, and the um, projection is based on that. Two, pro two projected winners in Arkansas, both Democrats, and both of their seats were already held by Democrats, so there is no change there. One of the controversies and continuing controversies in this country is over whether women should be allowed to have abortions whenever they want them. Our NBC News AP poll asked people their opinions on this question today. So far we have 26,000 of them counted and computed. Ask whether, whether any woman who wants an abortion should be able to get one. Of those questioned, 50% said yes. She should have an abortion when and if she wants it. 39% said, said no, she should not. The rest, we're just not sure. When we broke down those figures, we got some interesting results. We found that the percentages were the same for men and women. When we broke them down still further among people of various religions, we found that most Protestants and most Jews favored abortions on demand. Most Catholics opposed it. Another question about the best way to fight, in, uh, to fight inflation, and that is a question on which we have found nobody who did not have an opinion, or very few. 39% said cut federal spending. Not a majority, but it was the first of the options offered. Price and wage control, 23% thought that was the best idea. And of cutting taxes, 6% thought that was the way to do it. All during the campaign, the Republican Party has, of course, made a big issue of uh, tax cutting, but it seems not to have paid off for them very well. Tom? David, you uh, just projected, as you said, the Attorney General of Arkansas, now elected governor. He is 32-year-old Bill Clinton. That state is developing a tradition for electing young men to the governor's offices there. Uh, Dale Bumpers and David Pryor. Pryor has now been projected the senator. Clinton has his eye on the Senate at some point as well, we're told. He came out of the McGovern campaign, Yale Law School, and he was a Rhodes Scholar. In Tennessee, another young man, this one a Republican. We're projecting in Tennessee. A bit of an upset tonight. That uh, state house goes to the Republicans. Lamar Alexander, a 38-year-old lawyer who was a member of the Nixon White House yeah, staff. We are projecting that he is the winner there. He was a television commentator in Tennessee, and apparently the voters of that state didn't hold that against him. He ran against a man by the name of Jake Butcher, a very wealthy young banker who will now be able to go back to his material comforts of a large private mansion, a private lake, and a two-engine private jet. In Florida, here's how it stands thus far in Florida, if we can take a look at the boat there. Uh, two men from Miami, 10% of the precincts reporting thus far. The Democratic nominee is Robert Graham, a land developer worth about $4.5 million, as you can see, with 10% of the precincts reporting. He has an eight-point lead over Jack Eckerd, a 65-year-old drugstore millionaire who was the former head of the General Services Administration. More Democrats than Republicans in Florida, but occasionally it will cross party lines. Graham campaigning hard in the middle and northern part of the state he even has his campaign headquarters in Tampa, even though he's from Miami. In South Carolina, we are projecting that Richard Riley, Richard Riley, who ran Jimmy Carter's presidential campaign in that state in 1976, Richard Riley, we are projecting the new governor of South Carolina, replacing an outgoing Republican. So, so far, there's been a switch. In Tennessee, the Republicans pick up one, but they lose one in South Carolina. And in Michigan, <laughs> we are projecting that Republican Governor William Milliken, running for his third term, will be reelected. He was in a very tough race against a young state legislator out there, 36-year-old William Fitzgerald, who had an awful lot of help from both Jimmy Carter and Ted Kennedy and from other well-known Democrats across the country. But Milliken, a moderate Republican, a big victory for the Republicans in Michigan then, as we are projecting that he will serve now a third term as governor of that important and popular state. Tom, wasn't it Jake Butcher in Tennessee? our projected loser who rented a baseball stadium and fed barbecue to 16,000 people. 
He did indeed. Oh. Would, you, would you assume that some of those came, ate his barbecue, and then voted against him? I don't, it appears that way. Barbecue apparently is replacing chicken as the staple on the circuit because the Republican candidate for governor in New Mexico said this year, the Bible says that man cannot get along on bread alone, but as a candidate, I can tell you, you can do pretty well on barbecue. May I uh, just tell one Jake Butcher story here very quickly? Jake Butcher was spending so much money in the primary in Tennessee trying to be elected governor that they said of him, of his campaign, that if you called Butcher's headquarters on primary day and asked for a ride to the polls, they'd let you keep the car. <laughs> <laughs> you think we might find that this election has been inflationary? Well, it's, the costs go up. We'll be back after this. <laughs> No! Now, don't you do it again! Hold yourself together. I say, talking to a trash bag? I have to. It's very undependable. <laughs> well, then get hefty bonded two-ply trash bags. They're double dependable. See? There's a tough outside layer to resist tears up and down. Bonded to a strong inside layer for strength side to side. Hefty bonded two-ply. It's one bag that's... Double dependable. You can count on it. Ford introduces a new wagon for the American road. The all-new LTD Country Squire for 79. A new wagon with more driver convenience, more handling ease, more window area, and more passenger room than last year's Country Squire. This land is your land. This land is my land. The all-new Ford LTD Country Squire for 79. See it at your Ford dealer now. What's the most efficient way to cook? Gas. It's America's most efficient energy system. You can make it even more efficient with a new energy-saving gas range. With features like automatic pilotless ignition that cuts gas use up to 30%, fast convection ovens, and more. If it's time to replace your old gas range, remember... The future belongs to the efficient. Our poll takers today have asked people, among many other questions, whether they thought President Carter should run for re-election again two years from now. In the past, more people have said no than yes, though in the poll taken just after Camp David, half said yes, they would like for him to run again. But today, today, only 37% of those asked said they would like Mr. Carter to run again. 42% said no, they would not. And the remainder of the people had not made up their minds one way or the other. Only a little over half of those who called themselves Democrats wanted him to run again, and only about half of those who voted for him last time wanted him to run again. So it appears there's, there is some work remaining for Mr. Carter to do, political work. John? Um, we were talking about seats that the uh, parties are losing to one another in the House of Representatives. We did report on the 6th District in Kentucky not long ago. That is going to a Republican, or has gone to a Republican, taken from the Democrats. That's the first time the Democrats have lost that seat in bluegrass country in 50 years, and the only second time since the Civil War. And here's one that's very interesting in terms of the personalities involved. Most of us remember Senator Edward Gurney from his appearances on the Watergate Committee, his defense of Richard Nixon, and later the charges that were filed against him by the Department of Justice. Well, he was acquitted on all of those charges, and he is rehabilitating himself by running for, in his old district for a seat in the House of Representatives. He is not ahead tonight. With about a fifth of the precincts in, Gurney is losing to state legislature Bill Nelson, who has quite a sizable lead with about 23% of the precincts reporting. If Gurney doesn't win that, that means a Republican seat in Florida goes to the Democrats. Now, let's have a look at some of the senators who are our projected winners so far this evening. Uh, we would like to review some of them. We've made a number of calls in terms of the Senate. Uh, the, um, as you can see, Chuck Percy in Illinois has been called by us. Uh, as a senator. Uh, that was a very important one, very difficult race. Uh, Sam Nunn in Georgia, uh, David Pryor in Arkansas, Donald Stewart in Alabama, Walter, Walter Huddleston in Kentucky and South Carolina, blue on your map there, Strom Thurmond, and next to it, blue on the map for Republican Howard Baker in the state of Tennessee. 
in New Jersey. That is colored red for Democrat on our map. Bill Bradley is our projected winner. Larry Pressler in South Dakota, a Republican, you see it there on your map, uh, is a projected winner. And um, that's about the way it stands now in the, did I mention Bill Clinton, our projected winner in, uh, he's a governor, he's a gubernatorial candidate. In any case, that's where we stand as of this hour, and we'll be back with more coverage of the 1978 election after this. Decision 78 continues with the Tri-State Report. Brought to you by Citibank and by Amoco. Now here are Chuck Scarborough and Jack Cafferty. Good evening and welcome back to our coverage of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. We have some votes in now. We're getting some numbers, some information from uh, Connecticut, New Jersey, where the polls have already closed. As we've been telling you and told you earlier in the evening, Bill Bradley has won election to the United States Senate in New Jersey. He will defeat Republican Jeffrey Bell. In addition, in New Jersey, there are 15 congressional seats up for grabs tonight, and we'll be reporting on 12 of them. And as I mentioned, we're beginning to get some vote totals in now, so we're going to go to the boards and take a quick look at some very early returns in the various congressional districts over there. In the third district, Democrat James Howard is the incumbent. He has a very early lead over his challenger, Republican Bruce Cole, with only 5% of the precincts reporting. Too early to call that one. In the 4th District, the incumbent is Frank Thompson. Again, he is leading right now quite handily, but only 3% of the precincts reporting. He is way ahead of Republican Christopher Smith. In the 5th New Jersey Congressional District, the incumbent is a Republican, Millicent Fenwick. Excuse me, we have lost the board. We will tell you that in the 5th New Jersey Congressional District, the incumbent is Republican Millicent Fenwick. The challenger is a Democrat by the name of John Fahey, and with 6% of the precincts reporting, the incumbent is uh, doing quite nicely at this point. We are, again, talking about very, very early returns. There's one where we have absolutely nothing to report. We will tell you that uh, the incumbent is Andrew McGuire, the challenger Republican Margaret Rockema. Um, some say that uh, Ms. Rockema's campaign did gain some strength late in, the, uh, late in the going, and she may, in fact, show very well. The next district that we'll be reporting on this evening is the 8th Congressional District. The incumbent there is a Democrat, Robert Rowe. He's been in the House for nine years. The challenger is Thomas Milani, the Republican with 1% of the precincts in. The incumbent is leading by quite a margin. Closer to home, the 9th Congressional District is just across the Hudson River. It includes towns of Teaneck, Bergenfield, Fort Lee, Tenafly, and an interesting story there. We have very few votes in, but there, Henry Helstowski is the ex-congressman from that district who is trying to get elected again. He is now running on the independent ticket. He was indicted for bribery in 1976, and Mr. Hollenbeck, Harold Hollenbeck, the Republican, now holds that seat, but Helstowski is trying to make a comeback. It's not expected that he's going to. Nicholas Mastorelli is also in the race. It's his first try for elective office. The 10th New Jersey Congressional District, Peter Rodino is the incumbent. He has been there for 30 years. He has won 15 consecutive elections. We have no votes in as yet. He is a heavy favorite to defeat the Republican John Pelt. In the 11th District, the incumbent, Democrat Joseph Minish, running against Republican Julius Feld, and with 1% of the precincts reporting, the incumbent again about a two vote to one margin. The 12th Congressional District in New Jersey, the incumbent is Republican, Matthew Ronaldo, and he's running against the Democrat, Richard McCormick, and we could tell you that Mr. Ronaldo has been in the House of Representatives for a period of six years. He is trying to be reelected. We have no votes in. The 13th District, Democrat Helen Miner. She is one of two women representatives from the state of New Jersey. She is running against Republican challenger James Corder with 3% of the precincts reporting. It's close there, but much too early to determine the outcome as yet. In the 14th district in New Jersey, Democrat Frank Guarini running against Republican Henry Hill. And this is an open seat. Neither of these are an incumbent. We have uh, apparently, yes, no returns in yet over there at all. Um, we'll be getting those probably later on. And the last congressional district that we'll be reporting for you here this evening is the 15th congressional district where the incumbent Democrat Edward Patton is running against Republican Charles Wiley and with 2% of the precincts reporting close race, but again, very, very early, only 1,800 votes in. We'll be back with more of our tri-state coverage right after these messages. An important message to people throughout the New York area. Now you can earn interest on your checking at Citibank. 
We've taken advantage of a new law and will now offer you 5% interest on checking. The highest interest any bank can pay, even savings banks. 5% checking is the newest addition to 24-hour city card banking. At Citibank, we think our customers deserve a lot of easy ways to earn more interest. 5% checking is the newest. Get it. You deserve it. The city never sleeps. Citibank. You expect more. Citibank is the leader. You expect innovative ideas from Amoco. We were a leader in developing lead-free gasoline, the first major brand with two grades of lead-free, the first with premium lead-free. Amoco Premium Lead-Free, proven by experience to help stop engine run-on, to burn smoother, and help stop knock. And even improve mileage, because you don't have to change the timing to prevent knock. Amoco Premium Lead-Free. As you've already heard this evening, Ella Grasso is our projected winner in the race for governor in Connecticut. 38% of the registered voters are Democrats in Connecticut. Governor Grasso got their support and got much more to take this election. And Tony Guida has more from our new Center for Associated Press poll. Tony? Chuck, our poll shows that Ella Grasso won re-election by keeping the loyalty of key groups of voters and by winning the respect of most Connecticut voters. Among the state's largest ethnic group, Mrs. Grasso's own Italian-Americans, 65% voted for her. She won 60% among women voters, and a healthy majority, 54%, gave Governor Grasso a job rating of good or excellent. Nine out of ten of those people also gave her their votes. She did well among black voters, she did well in the cities, and among supporters of women's rights. And most important, she showed strength in virtually every sector of the electorate. Chuck? All right, thank you very much. We are now just about two minutes, about a minute and a half away from the polls closing in New York. And we have some very, very interesting races in New York to look for. Look for. We expect to get some results shortly after the polls close, because we have a very tight governor's race. It's been seesawing back and forth in the polls. Uh, all right, Jack, uh, why don't we widen out here and we'll get, draw Jack into this. Yeah, we've got a, I and think we can do a, a quick look at a board, Chuck. We apparently have some returns on the Essex County executive race. The electorate over there reorganized the Essex County government in 1977, and they have a race on this evening for uh, the chief political job over there. And with very early returns in, the Democrat, Peter Shapiro, is way, way out in front of Robert Notte. The independent candidate is a gentleman by the name of Stuart Braun. And at this point, Mr. Braun is having a tough evening. But um, again, not even 1% of the precincts reporting will be watching that, as well as the highlight question. There are three congressional districts in Connecticut, all of the New York statewide races. So we'll be back. Indeed, we expect our return shortly from New York. So we'll see you in about 20 minutes' time. Beyond.